Glass is a strange material. Its original source material is sand, but it needs human intervention through the application of heat and other processes to find form. We can see through it, but we can't touch what's on the other side. You can use it to concentrate a light source, or it's helpful if you want to protect your eyes, but still see what you're doing. Both solid and fragile, glass can be used to make art or poison balls. It often depicts tales of myth or religious instruction through stained glass in churches, and we can't forget its appearance in fairy tales through glass coffins or slippers. So let's take a look at how glass appears in the world of superstitions, fairy tales and even fairy lore in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are continuing with the Folklore of Materials theme this week, and having already looked at metal and stone, we're now going to be having a look at glass. And as I said in the introduction, glass is a bit of a weird material, because I know it does in some places form naturally, when, for example, lightning discharges into the ground in places like deserts and stuff. But in the form that we know glass, it's very much bears sort of the intervention of humans, be that either through industrial processes or things like sort of blowing glass and stuff like that. Personally, I absolutely love glass. I'm a big fan and I absolutely love particularly blue glass. I always think that looks really cool. I do have a little bit of a personal connection with glass because my granddad used to work for Pyrex. And if you've never come across Pyrex before, they essentially made kind of unbreakable glass. So it was like if you could use it in like a chemistry lab, for example, you could heat it up, do whatever your experiment was, and then put it straight under cold water and it wouldn't break. So yeah, that's a really, really good selling point for a business to create a product that you then can't break and therefore don't need to replace. But yeah, so I've I've always loved glass and I'm quite fortunate that the National Glass Centre is just down the road from me in Sunderland. And if you haven't been, I would recommend it. But we are going to start off looking at glass superstitions. And actually dreaming about glass in general apparently referred to women. But if you dreamed that someone gave you a glass of water, then a marriage or a birth would happen in your family soon. Now, there's a lot of superstitions around breaking glass as well, which is quite interesting. So if you dropped a glass while taking a drink, you'd soon hear sad news. But if the glass fell and didn't break, you would have great success. And there is also another version which says that if the glass fell and didn't break, you'd receive a present or another one that your friends were loyal. Now, if you turned a whiskey glass upside down, that was apparently a death omen, while breaking a tumbler meant a secret would be discovered. If glass dishes broke on the pantry shelf, it was a bad omen, and glasses or pitchers that broke for no reason meant a death in the family. Now, this did also apply to glass jars of preserves, so if they cracked while being opened, it ultimately meant a death in the family. Now, I should point out that these death omen superstitions related to breaking glass are actually largely Western ones, because in Pakistan there was a belief that if you accidentally broke a glass, it meant that evil was actually leaving the house and good luck would arrive instead. Now obviously that didn't work if you actually intentionally broke a glass, but if you accidentally broke one then it was actually a a good sign instead. But as I say, in the West a lot of the associations with breaking glass are bad ones. And there's another one that you could expect bad luck in the coming year if one of the panes in your window broke. I would argue that one probably dates to a time when glass was a lot more expensive and therefore it would be such a pain to replace it, no pun intended. But also if you heard a pain of glass fall, that was apparently a death omen. All I can think of is the film The Omen when it comes to glass, so there we go. But you would die within the year if a glass that you were drinking from cracked, but if a man drank from a cracked glass, his wife would only bear him daughters, so that's worth bearing in mind. Now, such was the fear of broken or cracked glass that even Napoleon Bonaparte actually fell prey to it. And he apparently took a portrait of his wife Josephine with him on his campaigns. And during one campaign in Italy, the glass apparently broke. Now, he feared her death so much as a result that he actually sent a courier to check that she was okay. And Napoleon couldn't rest until the courier returned and assured him that she was safe. Now, there are a few other glass superstitions as well. So in Bohemia, it was actually bad luck to etch your name onto glass. And people also counselled women not to drink from a glass if it had a spoon in it. Otherwise, they would die as an old maid. I would also imagine that's a little bit of a health and safety thing that you don't really want to be 
lifting a glass up if there's a spoon in it near your eye. But there we go. And even filling a glass was fraught with problems. So if a glass was too full to take to the table without spilling it, you could actually drink the first mouthful and make a wish. If you did, it would come true. Meanwhile, if you were in the habit of filling a glass to the point that it overflowed, you would marry an intemperate person. Now, a lot of these superstitions do relate to glasses as the beverage holder rather than just glass in general. And this is indeed where the fairy law comes in because we can't talk about glass beakers without discussing the look of Eden Hall. Now, this is essentially a decorated glass beaker that's both gilded and painted. It's now in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. It was originally made in the mid-13th century in Syria. Now, much of its early provenance is unknown, but it does start to appear in various verses in 1729. It came with a leather case, which was inscribed with the Catholic IHS monogram, and Jacqueline Simpson has suggested its earlier owners may have used it as a chalice. Now, by 1791, a legend emerged about its true origins, and I say true in inverted commas, because according to an article in the Gentleman's Magazine, a group of people discovered a party of fairies making merry near a well named St Cuthbert's Well. Now, obviously, having the humans turned up frightened the fairies, and they then ran off, but they'd left behind this glass beaker. And one of them called out as they ran, if this cup should break or fall, farewell the look of Eden Hall. Simpson suggested if the look of Eden Hall was actually a Catholic chalice, then the fairy legend gave its owners a really good excuse to hang on to it, despite the political risks of doing so. I quite like the idea that it was actually left by fairies, but the very fact that it can be traced to mid-13th century Syria does rather suggest otherwise. Now, there are, of course, some links between glass and seeing the future, and we might more often associate crystal gazing with crystal balls, and ideally, these would be made of rock crystal, which is a form of clear quartz. But obviously some balls might be made from glass, which is cheaper. And indeed one turn of the 20th century method of crystal gazing involved using an egg-shaped ball of pure glass. And it was best to do your crystal gazing between 11pm and midnight in a dark room. And you would hold it in your right palm and concentrate on whatever it was that you were hoping to see in the glass. By midnight the crystal would become warm and if you looked into it you would then see whatever was happening with your friends far away and this is where it's linked back with the idea of you seeing whatever it was that you hoped to see. Some people believe that you could then use this method to keep tabs on partners or friends so it's less a method of crystal gazing to divine the future and it's more about being able to see what's happening in places far distant. Now Dr John Dee used a slice of obsidian in his efforts to talk to angels now, obsidian is a form of volcanic glass made from cooling lava. And I know technically it's an igneous rock, but at the same time, it's not crystalline like a mineral. So it does kind of fall under the heading of glass in the more wider sense. Obsidian can be used as a blade because its cutting edge is sharper than steel surgical scalpels. But that said, they are more brittle than their metal counterparts. But I think a large part of the reason for using obsidian is also the fact that with it being black, it is supposed to be easier to then actually see things in them if you are scrying with them. And what there's also a rather interesting phenomenon of the charm wand. And we have covered these before in the episode on amulets, but I thought it was worth using them again because they fit in so well with the concept of glass. Because they're, they're made out of glass and they sometimes take the shape of rolling pins or walking sticks. And the glass might have a multicoloured twist inside like a marble. Sometimes they were hollow and people filled them with coloured items like threads or beads and people essentially were supposed to use these wands for protection against the evil eye and if you actually wiped yours down every day it could even protect against sickness. Now Daniel Harms discusses them on his blog having found one in the Wayside Museum in Cornwall and this one takes the form of a walking stick made of glass and hung over the fireplace. The idea was that anything that came down the chimney would end up so transfixed by counting the bubbles in the glass that they wouldn't enter the home. Now, the homeowner would wipe them off in the morning and then burn the rag. George Soane describes them as a peculiar superstition from Devon, specifically used to draw disease away from the occupants of a house. Now, in the second post on charm wands, Harms does note that the breaking of a charm wand was a bad omen. Misfortune or illness would surely follow. And I think in a lot of ways, there's obviously the link between the wand and its magnetic powers for infections. Obviously, the idea of breaking it would be a bad idea. But I do also think that when you then add that to all the superstitions about breaking glasses being a bad omen, then you can kind of see why it was specifically attached to these wands as well. 
Now that said, it is more likely that people originally used these items as decorative ornaments and they only gained their magical associations later. And indeed, I actually came across some of these glass walking sticks and so on in the museum in Sunderland and there is a photo of them on my blog. But when it comes to glass items that may or may not have a useful purpose as well as being decorative, I do keep coming back to these glass slippers from the Cinderella story and the Cinderella story always confused me because I thought I don't understand how you'd be able to walk in glass slippers because obviously shoes move with your foot and that's essentially how you can walk in them. Now obviously I know that there are different forms of footwear that can be made from things like wood and people manage in those but it's just whenever you see the way that people design the glass shoes in Cinderella I always just think I don't know how she's walking in them, I really don't. And it seems like a really strange material for something that you're going to put on your foot because you think, well, if that breaks and you're just essentially putting all of your weight on broken glass. And I've done that before. I have actually stood on broken glass and in bare feet and it really hurts. So I was, I, it always, always struck me as strange. But while I was researching this piece, I actually found a Scottish version of the Cinderella story, which in some ways is almost more interesting than the more well-known versions. And while I didn't necessarily want to get into fairy tales, in this one, I think it is actually quite interesting having a look at the differences in it and how the glass slippers work. So in this version of the story, the wicked stepmother mistreats the nameless heroine essentially by withholding food. So she'll give her like a thread of beef or a thimble full of broth, but she won't give her what you would call a substantial meal. Now, thankfully, there's a little black lamb who comes to her aid and seems to produce food out of its ears, which is then able to help our heroine essentially find subsistence. And it's interesting that she's continually referred to as a little girl, which kind of makes the ending a little bit weird. And as well as obviously the stepmother withholding food, she also sets her these impossible tasks, like she has to make an entire cauldron of broth out of essentially minimal ingredients and so on. And eventually the lamb tells her to go to church and it'll sort out making the broth, but she has to leave before the end of the service. So the girl who is not called Cinderella, she's actually a nameless heroine, but she puts on her glass slippers and her nicest dress and she heads off to church. So as instructed, she sits at the back and she leaves before everybody else. So she, she does what she's told. But the prince has spotted her in the church and when he comes out, he suddenly realises he can't find her, doesn't know where she lives and essentially has lost her that time. But the following week, she comes back again while again the lamb is making dinner and he sees her again. Now this time she's in such a hurry to leave, she accidentally leaves behind one of the glass slippers. The prince then starts this really peculiar shoe fitting competition to find his bride because we all know that marrying someone that you've never even spoken to is a recipe for success. Now eventually he finally reaches the girl's house and one of the stepsisters insists that the slipper is hers. She actually cuts off her toes and part of her heel to get the slipper to fit, which I think is quite an interesting comment on the rather stupid beauty standards that we end up contorting ourselves to fit. But again, not really part of my point here. But despite the fact that the stepsister clearly looks nothing like our heroine and the story stresses how struck the prince is by her beauty, he assumes, oh, the shoe fits and then takes the stepsister away to his castle. Now, thankfully, this being Scotland, they do pass some talking ravens and they point out the prince's mistake, not once but twice. So the prince is just not getting the memo at this point. But he finally goes, hang on a minute, and notices all of the blood on his would-be bride's foot finally realises it's not the right woman. He takes her back home again and then also finds our heroine hiding where the raven said that she would be. So she then shows him the other slipper that she already owns. Obviously she can put both pairs on without cutting off bits of her feet and then the prince finally recognises her. I mean it takes him a while and the very fact that she essentially has to have the right shoes on doesn't really look very good for him, I don't think. But anyway, they then leave, ready to live happily ever after. And like I say, I find that a little bit odd when she keeps getting described as a little girl and a lot of her behaviour of bursting into tears and so on feels like she must only be about like nine or ten. But I'm hoping that she was older than that if the prince has taken her away to live happily ever after. Now, interestingly, the church attendance is only found in the Scottish version and it replaces the ball found in the other versions, and Carl Blaine suggests that the talking ravens actually represent Hugin and Munin, Odin's wise birds. But the tale really preserves the deeply impractical, and dare I say it rather unwise, glass slippers. Now, Blaine does note this material is essential to the story because the shoe cannot yield to the wrong foot. And in some cases, it's also re they're referred to as being made out of gold, but again, gold would not mould to fit a person's foot. 
So a material like satin or leather might be made to stretch. They might obviously also pop open if you try to fit the wrong foot in. You know, there's a, there's an extent to which I mean, I'm not going to be able to fit my rather large feet into a size two shoe, but I could probably squeeze them into like the size below mine. But obviously you can't do that with glass. It either fits or it doesn't. And given the slippers fit our heroine perfectly, they can only have been made for her. And then the slippers end up standing in for her in the, the story. So where she's not physically present in the story, she still is through this presence of the slipper. Like I said, Blind also discusses whether or not the slippers may have been made from gold. But I can't help thinking that in some ways, if they were made from glass, that offers something different to the story. Because yes, gold is valuable, but glass makes them more fragile. And that, to me, infers that these slippers are made to be admired, but not actually walked in. So they're the kind of shoes that you would buy to sit down in so that they look good, but you don't, you're don't you not expected to walk anywhere. And because of the fact that they're not actually designed to be worn in a practical sense, they then become an indication of the father's wealth since he bought them for the little girl. And since the slippers then stand in for the heroine, they indicate that she too is ultimately wealthy. So in some regard, you can, if you wanted to stretch it far enough, read that the slippers represent the little girl because she's the rightful inheritor of her father's wealth, whereas the stepsister isn't and she has to literally cut off parts of her foot in order to fit into that wealthy mould because the wealth is not ultimately hers. And like I say, the idea of glass slippers and cutting bits of your feet off just to get them to fit, I mean... Yeah, as I say, I'm not saying anything else about un unrealistic beauty standards, but I do think that that really does take the biscuit. But ultimately, what can we make of glass? Well, like I say, I think a lot of the superstitions revolve around the glass breaking because of the fact that that would obviously be A, something that you would then need to clean up, but B, it's something that you can't put back together again necessarily. And I think that this is why the glass superstitions, at least in the West, where dropping a glass for it not breaking becomes a good omen because that's something that's unexpected unless as I say you're using Pyrex and that kind of had a bit more of a tendency to bounce whereas by contrast obviously if you drop something and break it then obviously you then need to go and buy another so that thing has died in the fact that you can't use it again so you can see how it's then linked with death as well and obviously I haven't gotten to the glass coffin as well that's just weird I mean the glass coffin very much turns the sleeping princess whether that's sleeping beauty or snow white depending on which version of the story you look at it essentially turns what is otherwise a corpse into a bit of a spectacle and i know that technically speaking neither of them is actually dead but they appear as if they are and people assume that they are and i think again that it's that untouchable sense of glass where you can you can still see the thing but you can't touch the thing so the glass kind of forms a bit of a barrier and i think that that's kind of what makes glass more interesting in some ways than something like metal where metal forms a, a barrier, but not one that you can see through. Glass is also one of those things which wouldn't necessarily have been available to everybody at the same time, because obviously when you started getting glazing in, in, in large buildings, obviously that would be a sign of status and wealth, the more windows that you had because of the cost of glass. So it's a little bit like when you look at the different metals that we did in the first week of this theme, that obviously if, you're, if you've then got a lot of gold, for example, you've got a different set of superstitions attached to it rather than you do something like iron, which is a bit more common. And I think glass is the same. So I think, again, that's why a lot of the, the breaking of glass refers to death omens and so on. But I hope you enjoyed this anyway. It was quite a fun one to put together because I wasn't expecting it to be so many superstitions and so on associated with actually what was quite a normal and humdrum kind of material to us now. Next week, we're going to have a look at either paper or wood or possibly both. I haven't decided yet, so we'll, we'll see how that one goes. And then that'll be the end of this theme. If you do have any requests for what you would like for the next theme or for the rest of the year, indeed, then obviously feel free to put a request in. If you request something that I haven't already done and that I can actually do, then obviously I will do my best to actually use the requests that I'm given essentially some of the requests I get I have, I'm like well I've actually already got an episode on that but I am working on a new website which will make it much easier for you to actually find what I've done episodes on and what I haven't so that'll be coming hopefully in the next couple of months but anyway I'm gonna let you go and enjoy whatever it was that you were doing before you started listening to this I hope you have a marvelous day ahead I'll see you next week for our final episode in the folklore of material series cheerio well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. 
If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee. Or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.